Well, good morning. Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm thankful for the kind introduction, Dr. Greenway, and uh, I could not be more grateful and thankful that I'm here serving alongside of you. Uh, it has been one of the primary uh, goals of my life to be the answer to a trivia question. <clears throat> So I'm thankful to have that pointed out to me this morning. It's been almost a whole year uh, since I came to this institution. It's hard to believe that it's been almost one year. And in that year, uh, my wife and I uh, sold a home, married off a daughter, had a son graduate from college. We left friends in a church. We're here making new friends, found a new church. Getting to know faculty has been one of the best pleasures of uh, my time here and getting to know other people that work here and make the place happen. Uh, the grass around here doesn't cut itself. The flower beds around here don't weed themselves. The trees don't trim themselves. The buildings don't pressure wash themselves and the buildings don't repair themselves. The food in the cafeteria doesn't prepare itself and the books in the library don't shelve themselves and so I hope that as you see people around this campus on a day in and day out basis uh, making this place work uh, I hope that you <clears throat> will take the time and express your appreciation to them uh, for the things that they do uh, oftentimes uh, behind the scenes and many times without much uh, appreciation so let's uh, make sure that we make this place a happy place to be, not just for students, but for the place, for the people that work here and uh, serve this institution in ways that are uh, often untold. My wife and I <clears throat> have been married. We celebrated our 29th uh, wedding anniversary just a couple of weeks ago. And I want you to know how thankful I am for her uh, making a move and going through the things we've gone in the last year would have been impossible uh, without her uh, along my, by my side. My five children that are here uh, have all with unbelievably great attitudes made a transition in the middle of their teenage years, in the middle of uh, all sorts of things that they were enjoying in Louisville, Kentucky, and I'm thankful <clears throat> for them as well. Paul is writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. And this is what he says. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the name of the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, <clears throat> able to teach, patient, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Just prior to that particular passage, Paul is talking to Timothy and He's encouraging him. He says, now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood, clay, some for honorable use, some dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So what does it take to be this vessel of honor? Well, Paul tells us in the very next passage. One who's going to be a vessel of honor must flee youthful passions. Now, I don't think Paul particularly here is addressing sensual passage, pa, uh, pa, passions, although I think he certainly has that in view. I think he's more likely warning about the youthful tendency to immaturity, general poor judgment. When my older boys were 15 years old, about to turn 16, excited about getting their driver's license. 
They said, Dad, we're going to be driving real soon. I don't think so. Well, why not? It, we're 16 years, we're going to be 16 years old. And you're allowed to drive when you're 16 years old. And I said, well, fortunately for all of us, I know you a lot better than the state of Kentucky does. And driving is not about knowing when to stop and when to go. What to do on a green light, what to do on a yellow light, and what to do on a red light. Driving is about judgment, of which you have none. You're 16 years old. That's why every actuary in America knows you don't have good judgment. That's why your insurance is double what your sister is going to pay. Youthful, poor judgment. What are some of the marks of this immaturity, this tendency to have these youthful passions? Well, number one, someone who is not fleeing youthful passions compares himself constantly to others. He's always looking out the window. He, think, he thinks to himself, I've been at this church for 10 years and have only seen moderate progress and that guy over there has been at his church only two years and it's growing like crazy. He believes what he sees and reads on social media. He compares his unfiltered life with everyone else's filtered life. He believes what he sees on social media is real. The guy that puts on there, the deacons, just bought me a brand new car. What he doesn't know is they're about to fire him. They're just trying to make it easier. The guy and his wife standing in front of Mount Rushmore smiling. What you don't know is they just argued five hours in a row right before they took that picture. Just baptized 5,000 people today. That's not true. He regularly feels shortchanged by God himself. Jesus speaks to this in Matthew 20. Jesus tells a parable about a master of a house that needed some work done. So he goes out early in the morning to find some workers and he agrees to pay them for a day, one denarius each. And then he goes out again a little later and then a little later. All the way up until almost the end of the day and there's only one hour left to work. And he hires some more laborers and then he does something incredibly unusual. As he's settling up, he gives every worker the same wage. The same wage. The guy that worked all day gets the same amount as the guy that only worked one hour. And the guys that worked all day are complaining and they're grumbling. They're upset about it master of the house has a little something to say about that. Am I not allowed to choose what to do with what belongs to me? Can't I do with my own things what I choose to do with my own things? Or do you begrudge my generosity? God does not owe us an explanation. He knows where you are. You don't have to seek positions you don't have to compare yourself constantly to what's going on around you with others. What God is doing with them is what God is doing with them. One of the things we <clears throat> have said in our home is that inequity is the great equalizer. Inequity is the great equalizer. The one thing that we all have in common is that we don't have everything in common. And one of the things that I've tried to do and my wife has tried to do with our children is intentionally create moments of inequity with our children to remind them not everything's the same in this house. Every kid is different. Every kid has different needs. When the kids were younger, I would bring home a gift when I was traveling and I would bring home one gift for one kid and pull all the kids together and say, seven of you are getting ready to have an opportunity to rejoice with one of you. Always looking over the fence into someone else's yard is an indicator that you might not be leaving behind youthful passions. Number two, someone who's not fleeing youthful passions is always impatient in their leadership. 
He wants the church to grow immediately. He wants the people of the church to follow him immediately. He wants them to respond immediately. And when they don't, he just goes somewhere else. He gets the buddy he met at seminary to send his resume out to five different places, and then he goes to another church with the same expectation of immediate response, and he gets disappointed, and gets disappointed, he does it all over again. Every three years. He or she wants recognition for their perceived gifts immediately. Their first mistake is thinking they're gifted in ways that they aren't. They lack self-awareness that a more mature believer might have. And they may think to themselves, I know others as young as I am and have the same lack of experience that I have aren't ready for this, but I'm the exception. I'm ready for this. One of the biggest mistakes I think we're making in the evangelical community is connecting connected to giving young leaders too much too soon. When I was 32 years old, <clears throat> I had just started leading an organization called the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. And I went to Steve Farrar, who was a council member at the time, and I said, I want to write a book on manhood. Now, before I tell you what he said, I want you to know he was kind, respectful, humble. He was not arrogant. He was exemplary in tone and attitude, but this is what he said to me. You're only 32 years old. What could you possibly have to say about manhood that would be enough to fill a book? Well, all right. Funny to you, I can tell. Wasn't funny at the time. But you know what? He was right. He was right. If I had written that book at 32, I promise you, I would be humiliated right now. I would be giving all of my energy, finding that book, and throwing it in the garbage. I would have humiliated myself. Another, another mark of someone that is not fleeing youthful lust is he seeks attention for himself. So, some of you are just too eager to be known. Some of you are too eager to have platform and recognition and followers on Twitter and Instagram. Some of you are just simply too eager to matter more than you do. You're too eager to get in the game. It's alluring, but you're too eager to get in the game. And then when the coach, the coach does put you in to pinch run on third base, many of you run out there and act like you just hit a triple. A young man is worried when he's missing, that he's missing opportunities for himself. Someone who's not fleeing youthful lust always, or is always looking around the corner for another opportunity, afraid they're going to miss out on some grand opportunity. Where an older man worries that tomorrow there's going to be one more added responsibility to his life. Often I have the opportunity to give counsel to young men and women who have decisions, vocational decisions, opportunities in their life. And often they'll say something like this, this is, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. And I'll say, no, this is just the opportunity of your lifetime so far. It's not the opportunity of an entire lifetime. It's just your little lifetime. It's just the opportunity, best one you've seen so far. A while ago, I had a young man who was a student at another institution. <clears throat> and he said, it seems to me that all of my friends and other people on campus are getting all sorts of opportunities to do things and I haven't gotten one of those opportunities. Do you think that I need to more overtly throw myself out there and put myself out there? I said, no, you're gonna be fine. 
God knows where you are. Do you really believe that God knows where you are? God knows where you are. And you're gonna be fine. In fact, it's gonna be awesome for your soul and your future to serve in complete obscurity. No one to recognize you. No one to tweet about you. No one to put pictures of you up on Instagram showing all how awesome you are. That's actually good for your soul. Paul told Timothy, don't be hasty in the laying on of hands. It is not good for a young person to get too much too soon. And yet in the evangelical community, we prize youth to such a degree that we've set up an entire system where the young feel a sense of entitlement to position and a platform. And then crazily, we give it to them. And guess what happens? They can't handle it. It's not because you're a bad person. It's not because you're evil. It's because you're too young. That's what Paul is warning Timothy of. Don't, don't give in to these youthful passions. It's one thing when position seeks you. The problem is when you start to seek it. When you start to seek it, it sets you up for this sense of entitlement. And all that leads to is pridefulness, failure, perceived lack of need for others, a disaster. Paul says, no, have this mind in you. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count it. Equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Now, Paul is writing to Timothy, who is a young man. That is the context. But the temptation for, for youthful passion, to pursue youthful passion is present for women, young women, old women. It's present in older men. There are 50 year old men who are still seeking these youthful passions. You can tell when a believer is fleeing youthful passions, when you see a deference toward others, when you see him turning away attention from themselves, boasting only in the Lord and displaying the humility that it takes to do all three of those things. Now, becoming a vessel of honor does require fleeing certain things, but it also involves pursuing certain things. Righteousness, Paul says to Timothy, <clears throat> verse 22, right behavior in Christ. It's not pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Faith, this is part and parcel to righteousness, faithfulness, fruit of the Spirit, Love, again, Paul is continuing to point us to the fruit of the Spirit. Peace. Hebrews tells us how discipline brings about the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Right behavior leads to peace. Peace. If everybody was behaving rightly, we wouldn't need people called peace officers. Along with those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. Those who believe. Believers. Believers. Because what Paul is trying to tell Timothy, I believe here, is that you're not doing this alone. You're in the company of other believers. Older men are to be like a father to the younger men. Older women are to be like mothers to the younger women. Fleeing youthful passions recognizes that you're not in this alone and that it is necessary to turn to those who are older than you, wiser than you. How will I know if I'm fleeing youthful passions? Because you're gonna have the right people in your life that will tell you if you are or you're not. And then Paul says, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. Paul here probably is 
referring back to this thought of fleeing youthful passions. The youthful lust to give equal attention to every contest, to every argument. There's an overzealousness that is usually present in one's youth. Not everything is worthy of your attention. Sometimes in the zeal of one's youth, one is tempted to argue about everything. Everything is a 10 on a scale of one to 10. But some controversies are ignorant, he says, and pointless and just lead to quarrelsomeness. And this is the rub. Yes, Paul told Timothy, let no one despise your youth. It's very possible that Timothy, as a young man, a very timid man, would have been intimidated by the older men of the congregation. So Paul did tell him, don't let anyone despise your youth. But also, here he's wanting Timothy to have some sense of self-awareness that he's going to have certain passionate tendencies, negative passionate tendencies that are inherent in his youthfulness. He will tell Timothy to rebuke, exhort, and charge. But he also will expect him to know when and how he's supposed to do it. And that ability comes with wisdom. And wisdom typically comes with time. And that's the point. These are youthful, youthful passions. And then when Timothy does rebuke and reprove and correct, he's supposed to do it in a particular way. In verse 24, Paul says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Can you believe he said that? He said to be kind to everyone. It's in the Bible. That's incredible. Really, Paul, who presided over the stoning of Stephen, all of a sudden, is telling all of us now to be kind to everyone. Yes, that is the difference the gospel makes. Over the last 29 years of marriage, Dana, my wife has developed a sixth sense with regard to me. She knows exactly when something is about to go down with me and she always at the perfect time knows when to lean over and whisper in my ear, be nice. I'm embarrassed to tell you how many times she's had to say that to me. Be kind to everyone. I cannot begin to tell you over the years how many people I've met that claim to be believers. They just seem mad about it. I am a believer. I'm just not mad about it. I don't want to be mad about it. Nothing to be mad about. Have you ever asked yourself the question, do people people lament when they see me coming? Because I'm so negative, I'm complaining. It's hard for me to be nice, kind. Better yet, because of the likelihood of self-deception, why don't you ask somebody else? Do you ever regret it when you see me coming? Do you think people regret it when they see me coming? When they see my number pop up on their phone, do you think people regret it, lament it? Able to teach, Paul says. Why? Because it's a means to an end with regard to an opponent with whom you're embroiled in controversy. If you're going to win over an opponent, you better be able to clearly and effectively communicate the truths of God's word. It's a craft to hone. Just because you have the truth does not mean you're effective in communicating the truth. Some of your tendency to be quarrelsome might be rooted 
in your inadequacy as a teacher. That's okay. That can be improved. But what we often do is we have it in our head. We know what we think is right. And we try to communicate that to someone else. And they don't get what we're trying to say. And we just naturally assume it's because of their stubbornness, their ignorance. When it may just be you're not a good teacher. You're not communicating the truths of God's word very effectively. And what you do because you're blaming it on the other person is that you double down and just keep saying the same thing over and over. That's called quarrelsomeness. Patiently enduring evil. One of the evidences of maturity in Christ and a flight from youthful passions is how one approaches being wronged. And how might this patience in the face of evil be demonstrated? Again, Paul keeps pointing us back to the fruit of the Spirit. 25, correcting his opponents in gentleness. Notice how often Paul in his epistles keeps pointing and exhorting his audience to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Pursue love, correct in gentleness, be patient with them all, demonstrate kindness. We think that our sense of righteous indignation warrants anger. And then when we get angry, we just automatically assume that we are being angry and not sinning. That is a wrong assumption. Many years ago, when I was a much younger man, I had a professor at an undergraduate institution where I'd just spoken in chapel a couple of days in a row write an editorial in the student newspaper publicly criticizing me. And it made me mad, mad as fire. So I wrote him a letter. Now that ought to tell you a little bit as to how long ago this was. And I blasted him. I blasted him. Dr. Greenway, the letter that you read in chapel on Tuesday would not have held a candle to the masterpiece that I put together for this man. It was loaded with perfect barbs, the exact right one-liners, full of snarkiness, sarcasm, and the just right amount of personal attack. And then, for good measure, at the very end, I doused it with enough venom so as not to kill him, but just so he would remember it forever. It was amazing. I was so proud of it, I photocopied it and mailed it to my friends who were equally as ignorant and immature as I was. So then I get phone calls. This is amazing. You really told him, and I'm, I am basking in all my own self-glory in my office. And the man wrote me back. And he said, are you just trying to hurt me? And hurt my feelings instead of responding in a more Christ-like manner? And even then, I'm sitting in my office saying, hurt feelings, please. You started it. As one of my friends says, if <clears throat> don't start none, there won't be none. But really, what was I trying to do? I was trying to hurt him. I was trying to hurt him. Why? Youthful immaturity. It seems so, so big and so right. I didn't send photocopies to my older friends. They would have said, don't do that. Why are you doing that? But what was I missing in my youthful passions, gentleness, gentleness. And why do we need gentleness? Because of God's heart for all people. Paul says, because God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So, so in your correction of others, 
ask yourself a correct question. Are you really trying to win your brother? Do you really care about the spiritual well-being of your so-called and seeming opponent? Or are you just trying to grandstand for your friends, hoping for extra likes and retweets and a host of go get from equally immature people in your life? Are you really trying to help them, as this text says, to come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will? Or are you just trying to be right so you feel self-congratulatory? Or do you really care about the person? You see in these two verses, just the heart of God through Paul, even for those who have been ensnared by false teaching, the compassion, the care, And you see how Jesus fulfills all of this. Jesus is the perfect vessel of honor. He's the perfect vessel of honor. He perfectly discerns between turning over the tables or the money changers, showing the compassion for the woman at the well, perfectly knows when to rebuke rebuke the scribes and Pharisees, and when to give no answer before Pilate. He perfectly displays meekness, gentleness, fruit of the Spirit, the exact thing that Paul is calling us to here. Paul told Timothy in his first letter, he says this, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, fight the good fight of faith, take hold of eternal life to which you were called, and about which you made good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time, he who is blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings, and Lord of Lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for your word, thankful for the exhortations through Paul to Timothy to flee youthful passions. I pray that you would give us all the wisdom, courage, zeal, the indwelling, pray that the indwelling Holy Spirit would convict us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. I pray that you would continue to put older men and women in our lives so that we can continue as you sanctify us to flee youthful lusts and walk in your light. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.